All good. All right. Got quite a full house here. Nice. All right, so I'm going to talk about is JSON be a silver bullet? And uh, the, real, the results may surprise you. All right, so um, I work as a DevOps uh, slash full stack developer at Con Solutions like Squidix. We make uh, medical slash financial software using Python and Postgres most of the time. And uh, we really like Postgres, maybe a bit too much. Um, there's my little Twitter screenshot there. If you guys want to follow me, don't know why you would. Don't do anything. Um, basically, this is what the talk is going to be about. What is JSONB? JSON versus JSONB. Sometimes you might actually want to use JSON over JSONB, but that's really very specific situations. Um, some cool things, some limitations of JSON, JSONB. JSON, JSONB, and tables, and somewhere halfway in between. Um, when you could use JSONB, when I think maybe it's not such the best idea, and then some conclusions. Right, so what is JSONB? Um, just imagine JSON, but you can query it in a database. It's amazing. Um, first introduced in 9.4, and then JSONB in 9.5. Um, JSON basically checks, is it valid JSON, um, which is actually a different passing function to when it's being read, which means you can technically insert something and not be able to read it. We'll see that just now. Um, and then JSONB is basically um, just stores it in a binary format, so there's no strings being stored. And we'll see that just now. So. JSONB, uh, we have some types there. Um, string is converted into a text field when it's stored in the database. Number is converted into a numeric, so you do have uh, limitations there on the size of the number that you can insert. Um, Boolean is a Boolean, and uh, null doesn't really translate into anything. It's basically just the, a string null. So you can see there at the bottom I have select null is null is actually false, which is a bit confusing. Um, but then if you convert it into JSONB and check it with the string version of null, uh, then it's true. So that's how you would check that. This is just taken from the, uh, the Postgres docs there. You'll see I've got Postgres 11. I actually use Postgres 12 in my, in my examples where I test stuff. But um, yeah, that's just basic, basic JSON stuff there. Everything kind of makes sense there. Everything is standard JSON syntax. Cool. Yeah, some differences between JSON and JSONB. So uh, JSON is stores it as if it was a text field, because that's basically what it is. Text field with a type. Uh, JSONB stores it a binary format. Um, the JSON, like I said, is basically a string format. So it, it, it saves everything that you insert, new lines, white space, doesn't really matter. It compresses it though, so that's kind of useful. And uh, JSONB, because it's storing it in binary format, is not actually storing the string. So trims white space, reorders keys so that it's more efficient for searching. Uh, JSON duplicate keys are preserved, except for when you're querying. Then it'll take the last key, I think. And then the JSONB duplicate key is removed, taking the last key. Um, JSON only has a few functions. JSONB has many functions, but you can use the JSONB functions and then cast whatever you did into JSON again if you really want to. Doesn't really make much sense. Um, there's no indexes and no constraints on JSON, but there are a few on JSONB, so you can index a specific field or you can index everything with opt paths. That's quite a little bit, it's quite useful. Um, and then you do have constraints as well. So you would use uh, B-tree or gen or whatever uh, is most appropriate there for your indexes. For JSON, inserts and updates are quite fast. As long as you're not trying to manipulate something, then they're going to be quite slow uh, because it's just storing the text. It's not doing anything fancy. Uh, JSONB is going to be a bit slower because it's inserting and it's passing that, converting it into the types. So that's going to be a bit slower. So if you do an update on a JSONB field, it has to 
refigure out everything again because it's taking the whole the whole row is now or the whole uh, field is now being converted into a string when you manipulate something and then it's repassing everything again and then saving the, the binary format. Um, there are some optimizations from 11, I believe. Um, but yeah, it, it, is, it is pretty slow. So some cool things about JSONB, you can filter the data, you can index specific keys, you can index, index the whole thing with JSONB parse opts. Uh, you can add constraints. You can interact with the JSONB, so you can uh, make views on stuff uh, to, to make it easier for the application to query things. So that's pretty cool. And then also you have JSON path from Postgres 12, which is really cool. Um, unfortunately, forgot to add slides about that. Would have been nice, I guess. Some limitations, there's no statistics. So your query planner doesn't really know how many rows are going to be returned. So sometimes it might choose a bad option. Um, so it might choose to do a, s a different sort of scan or something, which is not ideal. The concat operator, so you can take two JSONBs and concat them together, but that's only on the top level. So it's basically doing a string concat and then figuring out everything afterwards. Um, max row size is 268 megabytes, which is the standard for any any field, a uh, string, uh, a text field is exactly the same. Um, NAN and infinities are not allowed because Postgres doesn't really have an, an idea of that sort of thing. Um, null is not null. That's something we always have to remember about. And the null byte character is not allowed because in C, a string is ended with a null byte character and then Postgres is like, I don't know what to do with everything else after that. So it just sort of dies. So experiment time. So what I did is I downloaded uh, 4 million tweets. I got Avengers and Game of Thrones keywords there. Uh, I saved them into a tweets table. And then I concatted them together, converted that concatted JSON. So it was a table with a single column that was just a JSON field. And then I made another table that was a single column adjacent B field. And then I took the first, the root keys, turned them into their own columns and anything that was deeper down, like the user, the retweet stuff, anything like that, if anybody knows what a tweet JSON object looks like, those were then JSON B fields. And then I modeled out everything fully into tables, no JSON B anywhere and then normalized it, so duplicate users were removed, that sort of stuff. Um, then I ran experiments. So that went well, that went well, that went well. Oh, something wrong happened. So what happened? Like I said, null byte characters not allowed. So Postgres allowed me to insert all of these null byte characters and it just went on as normal because it was just text fields. But then as soon as I started reading them, oh boy, it was confusing. And the context there kind of like tells you what's going on, but it's also not very helpful. So after a while, I was like, okay, let me remove all of these null byte characters. And then I got another error. And I was like, yes, what on earth is going on here? You can see there the name key there has a single slash. So Postgres is saying that, that you, can't, you can't escape a double quote there. It doesn't make any sense. Okay, so let's remove all the null bytes, but not the null bytes that, are, that have a slash in front of them, because obviously that's a now already escaped null byte. Okay, so that, that worked. Amazing. So this is the guy who caused the problem. <laughs> so uh, well, what did he have to say? Woke up early to see Endgame again. So uh, that was interesting. Uh, and it took a minute and 49 seconds to find that. All right. Unfortunately, this Twitter account doesn't exist anymore. Otherwise, I would have reached out to him to, to put his tweet there. So everything 
after having uh, two failures over there worked, we got our fully tables recognized. Okay, so experiment time. Those are the um, basically the the things that I changed in my Postgres config. Then I installed Postgres 12 and 18.04. I made a Python script that run, runs each query five times and four of them concurrently. And then uh, all of the values in the slides are averages without the min and the max values. So heated up the cache a bit. And then if anything was weird, maybe some other query stopped and then this query went through quickly was sort of ignored, but I show slides, I show a graph of all of the queries together so we can see. All right, science. Okay, so here we first start with the table sizes. Um, JSON B is of course a bit bigger than normal JSON because uh, of the type conversions, we're saving extra information there. The numeric type might take up more space than a normal number, which could be two or three characters. And then the interesting one was the, the mixed normalized. So that's the one where I took the root keys and turned them into columns. Not exactly sure why that one is so much bigger, but it, it was really interesting. But there we can see the place the tweet and the user there table t takes up not even five gigs, which is half the size of storing it in just pure old JSON. So here we start with the first query. Um, trying to find our, our favorite uh, favorite guy there. So, sort of uh, expected, except for the normalized one, which for some reason took a very long time. And the theory with that is that there's a lot more, uh, because the table is so much bigger, it just takes longer just to go through there. So you're using up more RAM, maybe caches are invalidated or whatever. And that's why it just took longer. It's like the only theory I could come up with for why that was slower. Here's the the runs. For some reason there, our JSON B friend had a very slow query once. But yeah, most of the other ones are pretty much together. Good grouping. So these, this is what inspectability is also quite important for developers. So if you need to go and add a column check what type something should be, all of that sort of stuff. It's, it's really helpful to be able to see there at number three, you can see that's fully modeled out all of the columns with all of their types. And you can quickly as a developer, just go PSQL slash D table name, get all the information that you need to know. Number two is a bit more helpful. That's the, the root keys there having types at least. Uh, but some of the stuff you still, you don't know what, what you're going to expect. And there with the JSON B column there at number one, it's what information do you have there? You have none. So what are you going to have to do? You have to select a few, try and see some patterns. Hopefully all the keys are there on, in the new one, on the new version or whatever and hope that all the data is correct. So inspectability is important. So uh, yeah, it's better. The more information you have, the faster you can get out updates, the less mistakes you're going to make, that sort of thing. So that's all, also important to know. So maintainability, all of those queries there, we have, uh, we're getting stuff there that might be null in the JSON B in the mixed, but, uh, and then in the tables, I, I can see that the projector isn't the highest resolution, um, but it's a lot, it's a lot nicer to be able to see the, the, the columns coming through there. You don't have to give something a, a name because it already has a name if your application uses the name of the of the column. Um, yeah, and it's a lot easier to see. So these are the, that's the runs there. As you can see the JSON is the slowest, the, the mixed one coming in second and the table's winning. And it's quite a big difference there. You can see three minutes versus 12 seconds is, it's quite a, quite a big difference. These are unindexed, of course, here you can see. And there's our our runs. For some reason, JSON, I didn't I didn't include JSON in this because it was just not enough space um, to see everything. There, JSON giving a few random, very slow queries. And everything else pretty much grouping together quite nicely. 
Okay, so now we're going to do some updates, but first we need the story time. So it's Friday the 13th. Jason wants to go home. And uh, his boss sends him a link to a tweet that he made. And this house we pushed production on Friday because we promised the client that we would. Amazing. By the way, follow this Twitter account. It's pretty funny. Um, but Jason made a mistake. His script to scrape Twitter saved everyone with less than a thousand followers with 200 too few. So let's have a query to fix Jason's mistake. So there we have our query. So basically, if you want to update a JSON B, you can use JSON set to take the original, uh, original uh, field that you had, update something that you wanted to update, and then you set it back to the original. So you're rewriting the entire row, which could be quite large. If you're taking a tweet into example, there's a lot of information saved inside there. The next one, of course, is we're going into the user, going into the user um, key there. So that's a, a, a another JSONB field, and there the the tables one. We're just updating the user table, which is much less to be writing to disk again, and much less reading. We don't have to cast like we have to cast our um, uh, types into integers again with the mixed and the JSONB. So that saves a lot of time. Um, and then when we get to the index queries, um, this is basically the same. All of the time is spent basically writing to disk. So here's our uh, our groupings again. This time JSON did a bit better uh, with its groupings. There are the tables way down at the bottom. But everybody tells me every time I say that JSON be slower than tables, actually you have indexes. So let's make some indexes. <laughs> All right. Uh, no idea why making an index on JSON is so slow. Um, I guess probably because it has to load everything in and then try and uh, pass it all, whereas maybe there's optimizations with JSON B it already being in binary format. But yeah, it's, it's quite a big difference there. And this will have an impact on your insert times because this is now an indication of All right. Um, so this is going to have an impact on insert times because um, this is now running on the entire table, so it's going to take 31 seconds to index the entire table of 4 million rows. But I mean, if you're inserting a lot of rows all of the time, it's also going to impact. And then also updates is also going to impact because it has to figure out what it needs to index again. Um, so yeah, that makes a big difference. There we have. Um, JSON B winning on tables again, probably just because of it's having to go through more data, sequentially scanning through all of that just takes more time because you have to load more of it into memory, read more from disk, and that's always going to add extra time. There we go. Grouping is a bit strange there for the mixed one and the JSON. JSON B basically pretty good. Table's pretty good, the grouping. Um, and now we do the queries for index. So now we are looking for our favorite guy again. And now our times are down to milliseconds, which uh, one millisecond, which is great. Uh, tables there is a bit slower, and uh, an explain can tell us why. So we can see that we have two index scans to go through because now we're doing a join. We have to scan on the user name, and then when we do the join, we have to scan on the, the user ID as well. So that's two index scans instead of one. So then of course it's going to be more time doing that. Um, we yeah, we can see there that the finding the, the user name took longer than finding the user, but it's still adding a little bit. So this time tables lost and uh, everything else is pretty much the same because it's just doing index scans. Pretty simple stuff. They are grouping. Jason B went a little bit funny somewhere along the line and uh, you can see there we have uh, an extra column there at the end. Um, so the the four on the on the left were all run 
with the Python script all running at the same time. So um, maybe a JSON query was invalidating caches for uh, a JSON B or whatever it was going on. And then I just saw the, the tables was doing quite bad. So then I did the tables by itself on hot cache. And as you can see, it, it, it did actually do better. So I assume maybe if I gave it more memory, it would have been a different result. But we don't always have more memory to give it. So sometimes we, we just have to be truthful about what we see. Um, here we're trying to find the last 10 tweets. Or, wait, is it? Oh, that, uh, that query is wrong. This is the, the last 10 tweets. Um, is it? Oh, no, this is creating indexes again. Sorry. Um, so, yeah, there, there we go. JSON is slowest again, probably because it has to read everything again. It's basically the same slide as the other one. Um, I assume just because the bottleneck is then just reading from, from disk and, and memory. They are, uh, are grouping again. Little loners up there at the top. Pretty much very good. And... Here we have our last 10 tweets again. So the, the darker orange one is the unindexed one. And then the, the lighter orange, which looks more like pink on this, is, uh, is the lighter one there at the top. As you can see, we're down to three, one, and two milliseconds, basically, on the, on the queries now. But it's a lot better. And this time, Jason B lost for some reason. Not exactly sure why. Um, but yeah, the groupings was pretty good, so it wasn't that. Uh, yeah, it's a bit strange. So here we have our index sizes. Uh, yeah, pretty much all the same because it's just it's B tree indexing the same thing all the time. Uh, don't know why the tables there, the timestamp milliseconds was one megabyte bigger. It's a bit strange. Here we have the the usernames, all basically the same again. And then there at the bottom we have two indexes for the username and then also the the user ID so we can speed up the the table joins. So here we have some backup examples. And uh there we have the, the lighter pinkish color is the, the backup time and the dark orange color is the is the backup size. So because we, s we have to now back up the keys and the values every single time, it is going to take up a lot more disk space. And uh, JSON B, I mean, the JSON not stripping out the white space that Twitter probably sends to you or whatever is, uh, is what took up more space. The compressed size of these tables, I didn't include it here, but they were pretty much all the same. So, yeah. And then the, the backup times was quite interesting. So that, that might be an example of how long it's going to take to read the rows from the table because you have a serialization stage with the JSONB, which is going to take longer than just reading a string out of the, out of the table for JSON. So if something is, if you don't need to filter on something, maybe you would use JSON there if you really need to optimize something like that. And then, yeah, table's taking a lot less space and a lot less time, probably just because there's a lot less to back up. So saving to disk is obviously slow, so that's going to in increase the time for those, those other queries there. All right, restore times. This was, uh, this was quite interesting. Don't know why the, the mixed ones took so long. I assume maybe because there's some optimization for for Postgres doing the uh, a st streamlining one field versus having to do three with the the, the mix normalized, and then the the tables taking the the least amount of time because there's less serialize deserialization to do and all of that sort of extra stuff, and then it's also less to be saving to disk, which will also then be adding time to that. So that's it's quite interesting. So when could you use JSONB? Um, oops. <laughs> so uh, when you've got NoSQL, but you need some acid. 
Sometimes it's a requirement that you, maybe a, a bank requires that you need to be saving something and you need, you need assurities on your data. Um, maybe Mongo doesn't say that you, you're going to have that transactions and whatever. Um, if you're storing document data, like maybe you're uh, storing the results of API queries or whatever, something like that. Something that you might want to store now, read once or whatever, and then maybe you want to filter on it to find some anomaly, something strange going on and you need to be able to find it. So, yeah, that's, that's where I've used it before and um, yeah, did, did a good job. Audit trail, it's something you're not really going to be reading a lot and filtering necessarily so that's a pretty good place and keys might change or whatever there's the next step uh, fast changing data if you are busy developing a, a new greenfield application or whatever you don't know what you need to be saving what types you need to be saving them as maybe stuff's changing quickly then it's a good place to start but then as soon as you've locked down what you're doing maybe going to tables is a good idea um, if you have lots of optional keys, maybe if you have uh, saving a user's settings or something like that, um, you just want to filter out all of the, if, you, if the user has like 200 different settings, you can't have 200 columns now to save all of that stuff. That's going to be most of them probably null or false or whatever. And that's going to be quite bad to be querying from that 200 columns. Um, when using it as an aggregate, this is quite interesting. So if you have a, if you're using a language like Python or something, you can, Python dictionaries is like class one. So if you give Python a dictionary, it's as happy as it's going to be. So if you have a, if you have an aggregate, maybe you have aggregating and then something might be changing. Maybe you have a, a, a user table that you're joining onto and something might be changing the user table. Then you can put an array there and have use JSONB as an aggregate. I really like that. Um, and if you have JSON data and you quickly need to do some queries, maybe you need to transform the data into something different, change some types around, whatever. But the the quickly there you can see is uh, is in bold. So yeah. <laughs> so when I when when I don't think you should be really using JSONB, we need to filter the data because that's uh, as you can see in our examples, it's it's adding a lot of time filtering through the data. If you do know exactly what you're going to be searching for and creating indexes for everything, then I guess it's not really that bad. Uh, when you need indexes, because if you're creating indexes, now your, your data is probably rigid. So you could probably put at least some of it into a table that you could join on maybe. If you need constraints, Again, maybe your data is becoming rigid, so then you could put some of it into tables. When you need a key value store, um, maybe JSONB is a good idea for that. But maybe also something different, like a Redis server or something, would be better suited for that type of thing. Um, when you could use a table, of course, that one's pretty uh, self-explanatory. We can see a lot of the times tables did a lot better than JSON, JSONB did. When people need to know what's going on, that's also kind of important. If you're just throwing stuff into a table and everything's just sticking there, the developer's going to be getting random stuff being null and missing keys and it's going to be, you're going to be putting if nulls in all of your queries and it's just going to look ugly and it's not fun. Um, and then when you need to store a lot of data in one row, of course, there was the the 268 megabytes limit on the on the JSONB field, which is the same for for any field. But yeah, a row can be a lot bigger than that. So conclusion: programming, like all other engineering, is all about compromises. So there is no absolute answer. If JSONB is working for you and then you're happy with that, then you should stick with that. If it's going to take too much time to go to tables, but you should really consider it, then that's, that's at the end of the day your decision. But we should do the, our best to assess the options. Maybe have someone take a week to model out some stuff and see if it's going to increase speeds.
because of course the client doesn't want to be waiting the 10 minutes for something to happen. And there's all of the everything on one slide. There I included the, the JSON as well, which is compressing a lot of the stuff into the top because it's the slowest most of the time. So then I just took it out and then there is basically what we want to know. So you can see there a lot of the time JSON be in the mixed with the with the with the losers and then tables was the winners except for in that one case they're finding our, our best friend in the with the indexes. So yeah, that's basically it. Any questions? Doesn't seem like there's any questions. Cool. Thanks, guys.